Alrighty. So what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about flow effects with MR <clears throat> on this talk. Now there's some sequences, uh, specifically the gradient echo type sequences, where you can get a lot of flow related enhancement, like we're seeing here in this one abdominal image and another very old image where we can see both arterial and venous flow related enhancement in the great vessels as well as within the, uh, the vessels within the liver itself. <coughs> but there are a number of different complex effects which occur uh, with flow. Now, if you remember when we talked about regular old-fashioned uh, two-dimensional Fourier transform type imaging, <clears throat> is that we would uh, first do a slice selecting uh, gradient. Uh, typically at the time you give the 90 degree pulse. A little bit after that, we would <clears throat> put in phase encoding. Then we'd put in the slice and select gradient again for the 180 degree pulse, and then we put in frequency encode fading when we receive uh, frequency <coughs> encode uh, encode uh, encoding at the time we receive the signal, and we were assuming that everything was stable, so that any uh, nucleus in a given voxel would see all of those pulse sequences. The question is, what's happening if during that all during that time frame where we're giving all those pulses? there's actually motion of, of nuclei uh, through tissues. So let's just take the example where we have a vein that's perpendicular to the slice plane that we're looking at. And so what you can see here is that it's, it's going to flow. And let's make it very simple right now and just use plug flow, which isn't accurate. And we'll come back to that later. <clears throat> that that the, um, Let's just I say that the... the Blood is just flowing along as a plug th through the vein. Then if there's a time delay between the 90 degree pulse and 180 degree pulse, what you can see is that some of the blood is going to flow out of the volume and some new blood is going to flow in the volume <clears throat> between, uh, between the, the pulse sequences. And in this particular case, what you can see that if... Uh, <clears throat> uh, if in order to be able to receive a signal, you have to see, for the echo, you have to see both a 90 degree pulse and the 180 degree pulse, then if there is a lot of flow between tissues, then this plug that gets the 90 degree pulse, by the time the 180 degree pulse is, is, comes along, it's flown out of the entire slice plane, and it will only see the 90 degree pulse, and it won't see the 180 degree pulse. If it's slower, then we can see that part of it might see the 90 degree pulse and part of it the 180 degree pulse. Uh, uh, so, so therefore we can get a lot of complex things. So in particular, if uh, where our pulse sequence requires that uh, the nuclei see both the 90 and 180 degree pulse, then what we'd have, there would be a linear drop off in signal intensity oops, within tissues in, in the vein itself uh, up to a point where the entire plug flow flows out of the out of the slice plane, at which case the signal intensity from that vein will drop off to zero, which means that the vein would be black. <clears throat> now that's one of, an, of several different effects that we're going to see among flow, but this is one where you can get flow-related loss of signal intensity uh, within the vein. And if it's uh, at an oblique angle, uh, you can see that the, the changes may be a little bit more complex than if it's just perpendicular to it. <clears throat> now, if you remember back, after we give the 90-degree uh, uh, pulse, then the Z component of the bulk magnetization goes to, to zero, and then it grows back up again. Uh, and with short T1 tissues, it grows rapidly. With long T1 tissues, it grows slowly. We're all familiar with that uh, diagram. And what can happen here... Uh, uh, that uh, if if we have slow flow like in a blend, uh, slow flow like in a vein, and the time we're talking about now is not between the 90 degree pulse and the 180 degree pulse, which is very very a very short period of time, but between 90 degree pulse and 90 degree pulse, what you can see for slow flowing uh, blood like in a vein <clears throat> is that. Uh, in the area of the slice plane here, the fixed uh, tissues will see each 90-degree pulse. And let's say we, we, we have a TR of uh, 
say 500, which would be a, a nice value for T1 weighted image. Uh, then on the nuclei in the fixed tissues on either side of the vein, uh, all the nuclei will see the, uh, the uh, each 90 degree pulse. But if you have flow in the vein here, some of the blood is going to flow out in the between uh, 90 degree pulses, and there's going to be new blood filling in that has not seen the previous 90 degree pulse. So what happens is if you have tissue that has a long T1, uh, and, and let's say that uh, right here is about 500, uh, uh, a TR of about 500, well, what you'll find is that the tissue with the long T1 that sees all the uh, uh, 90 degree pulses, that after the first 90 degree pulse, the time when it sees the second 90 degree pulse, the Z component of the bulk magnetization vector has not grown back up to the full amount. It's only grown part of that amount. And therefore, when when you get the second 90 degree pulse, uh, the, the bulk magnetization vector that you rotated into the XY plane is going to be much smaller than it would be if it had complete recovery of the of the signal. And therefore, for long T1 tissues, if you have a short TR, you're going to get signal loss within those tissues. But what can happen with, uh, if you have flowing blood, is <clears throat> you're getting new blood flowing into the area of the vein in between 90 degree pulses. This new blood has not seen the previous 90 degree pulse, and therefore it's, com it's fully recovered, and therefore you can get increased signal intensity in the area of the flowing blood, <laughs> and this is called flow-related enhancement. So th this is uh, this is kind of typically what you might see, is as you start having 90-degree pulses over time, if the if the TR is much shorter than the T1 of the tissues, then the tissues don't have a chance to recover completely between each 90-degree pulse, and what you have is a progressive loss of signal intensity until you reach kind of a steady state. And typically, we see this in structures where we use short TRs, and that's more in the gradient echo type sequences, and we t tend to use then less than 90 degree pulses. Otherwise, you'll lose too much signal intensity. But when you, when you then do that for a whole series of pulse sequences that can be designed, what you have is new blood flowing into the area uh, <clears throat> of the vessel, uh, the nuclei on either side, which are fixed in space, see the previous 90 degree, uh, the previous uh, pulses, 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees. So these tend to give less signal intensity, whereas the area in the flowing blood, which is all new blood that didn't see the last pulse, is going to give maximum signal intensity. So using these sequences, you actually get flow-related enhancement. Here's just an example. Uh, here we can see here are the nuclei flowing in. And if we give a 90 degree pulse at this point on this slice plane, we'll saturate the nuclei in there for, uh, that are in the slice uh, area that we have encoded. Uh, <coughs> if we wait a 90 degree pulse, some of those saturated nuclei have flown out of the vox voxel, but now new unsaturated nuclei have flown in. Uh, flow, and then if we give another 90 degree pulse, we will have uh, uh, a lot of nuclei that are not saturated, and therefore we'll get much higher signal intensity from these nuclei than we would from the ones next to them. So this would be flow-related enhancement. Now, typically what we have in vessels, though, is not bulk flow, but you tend to get laminar flow, where the flow in the central part of the vessel is more rapid than the flow in the periphery. And therefore you can get differential enhancement of the signal uh, 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 inside the vessel. And off, this is what you can uh, off occasionally see if you look for it. If you have an axial sequence that's perpendicular to the flow of the vessels, the central flow is going to be much more rapid than the flow in the periphery. And you can often get flow-related enhancement only in the center of the vessel with a loss of signal intensity in the periphery. And it may also depend upon exactly which pulse you have in a series of, uh, of slices. So you, sometimes you can get dot within the nuclei, within the center of the vessel due to this differential flow, flow speed uh, with flow-related enhancement. And here's just an example in the neck where we can see in the, uh, 
uh, carotid artery here where you can get central flow related enhancement uh, uh, due to the uh, this effect. And here we can see it in the inferior vena cava here, central flow related enhancement with peripheral loss of signal. Yes. Uh, now, you can also, if the, if the flow is too rapid, uh, uh, so that the nuclei don't see all of the sequences within the, within the in individual group of pulses that are necessary to produce a signal, or if the signal, uh, if the flow is too turbulent so that it mixes up all the nuclei, <clears throat> you can get areas of flow-related signal loss. We've already seen this, I think, in some of our other examples, but this is just turbulent flow in the CSF around the cord where it looks almost like flow voids, like you might have a large venous malformation, but this is just due to uh, flow-related signal loss within the CSF with, uh, around the, the cord. Now, other areas where we can see this, uh, you can see these kind of effects anywhere you have flow. <clears throat> Here happens to be a bladder. And uh, occasionally, if you look for what we can see here, this is a stir sequence on the left, a T1-weighted image on the right. What it looks like is that there are two little black areas within the bladder on the left, and those same areas are bright in signal intensity on the T1-weighted image. If you follow these back in the, in, uh, with, at different locations, you can actually follow those two signal changes <laughs> uh, back <laughs> to the actual ureters. And what these are are jet effects of the urine jetting out from the ureters into the bladder, and here we're getting flow-related signal loss, and here flow-related flow related signal enhancement uh, within the bladder itself due to the jets from the ureters with the urine flowing into the bladder. Now, we, we often don't want these flow-related effects. Sometimes we do, like in angiography, where you uh, the uh, both black blood and bright blood can be used to pr produce angiographic images, and in particular, a lot of the angiogram, a lot of angiograms we do that do not use contrast enhancement. Uh, we use flow-related enhancement with gradient echo images, like we uh, kind of talked about briefly a minute ago, uh, to get bright signal intensity within vessels, and therefore do angiography that way. But often we don't want them, like the flow-related signal loss in the CSF around the cord. Uh, that could mimic a vascular malformation. So there are a number of ways that we can get rid of motion artifact. Uh, of some pulse sequences like STIR and a thing called navigator pulses, which I'm not going to go into here, can help decrease uh, flow-related enhancement. If you have regular flow, either uh, vascular or actually a motion from the chest, you can trigger, you can typically trigger on an EKG so that you can... Uh, try to acquire the images at a time when there's minimum flow, like during diastole. Uh, for the chest, we can use respiratory or compensation. And then we can also use what's called gradient motion compensation. It's misspelled. Uh, which uh, I'm just going to try to briefly explain how this works. So if we have flow coming into uh, 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 flow perpendicular to the slice plane like we're seeing here, uh, <clears throat> we can see the typical laminar type flow with uh, increased flow in the center. Uh, it, what happens is that the nuclei, if they're flowing into a, grain, a gradient so that there's higher magnetic field on the right than on the left, then the nuclei that are flowing faster are going to gain more phase uh, than the nuclei that are, that are smaller because they're rapidly moving into areas of higher magnetic field while the gradients are on. Uh, and this is a, a diagram of, of what would happen then. If you have stationary tissues, uh, when you put on the, uh, the uh, gradient uh, uh, for typical pulse sequences, what you can see is a loss of signal intensity uh, and then uh, a gain of signal intensity if we have first a negative gradient and then a positive gradient. 
but if you're actually having flow extending uh, to the right into the area of higher uh, 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 magnetic field with the gradient, what we have is when you're flowing in, you're, you're losing gradients, you're losing phase because it's a negative gradient, but you're actually flowing into an area of higher gradient, so you actually lose less than you would if you were stationary. And then when you actually flip it over and uh, positively, then you gain a lot of phase. And therefore, in a situation like this, if the gradient is from left to right and the flow is from left to right, what you get is the flowing blood gains a lot more phase, whereas the stationary blood will get no phase because it'll have a negative gradient and then a positive gradient. Uh, so, so this is an area where you would, you would get a nuclei out of phase with one another uh, if you tried to image just with that. So that's just a constant uh, reversed gradient like you might might have with, with imaging. Uh, then, however, if you put if you put two together, so you have a positive, two negatives, and a positive, uh, what happens is you can then correct for constant, constant flow, flow so that so, uh, stationary, stationary. What's that all about? So stationary, stationary speeds ends up. Ends up Oh, we're getting an echo. Well, in a situation like this, stationary spins. Stationary spins would would not gain anything, and constant motion uh, flow would end up having whatever it gains being reversed. And by and doing by the higher and higher, higher orders, orders, you can correct, you can correct for, for uh, steady, uh, steady velocity, uh, acceleration, acceleration, or jerk. And so you can do so higher and higher, higher orders, orders to get rid of more and more, more artifacts, artifacts due to, uh, 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 due to uh, the due gain to of phase gain from phase flow. flow. I'm going to skip even echo rephasing, rephasing because we really because don't need that anymore. It was something that was common in older days. Does, does everybody does hear the echo? Yeah, not the creepy. Yes, I'm still hearing it. I hear the echo. 